good day, and welcome to the Kojigo Inc. and Kojigo Communications Inc. third quarter 2021 earnings conference call. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Mr. Patrice Mimay, Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of Kojigo Inc. and Kojigo Communications Inc. Please go ahead, Mr. Mimay. Thank you. So good morning, everybody, and welcome to our third quarter conference call, which uh, Philippe Jeté and I will present. So as usual, before we begin this call, I'd like to remind listeners that the call is subject to forward-looking statements, which can be found in our press releases issued yesterday. I will turn the call over now to Philippe Jeté. Merci, Patrice. Good morning, all, and thank you for joining us to discuss the, finance, the financial results of Kojiko Communications and Kojiko Inc., let me first note that we're satisfied with Kojiko Communications' overall performance for the third quarter of fiscal 2021, which is in line with expectations at both our Canadian and American broadband segments. On the media side, for the first time since the start of the pandemic, our radio business has grown with a 23.6% increase in revenue and a significant improvement in our EBITDA margin. With the gradual loosening of restrictions and the economy opening up again in Quebec, we are optimistic about the future. So all in all, these results position us well to start our fiscal 2022 on a strong footing. Before going with the specifics in our segments, I'm excited to discuss our most recent announcement from our U.S. broadband subsidiary, Atlantic Broadband, that entered into a definitive agreement two weeks ago with White Open West, known as WOW, to purchase all of its broadband systems located in Ohio. The WOW Ohio systems pass approximately 688,000 homes and businesses in Cleveland and Columbus and serve approximately uh, 196,000 internet, 61,000 video, 35,000 telephony customers. For the 12 months ended March 31st, 2021, revenue was 244 million US dollars and pro forma adjusted EBITDA would have been 103 million US dollars including adjustments to reflect the expected cost structure of ABB and the run rate synergies. This acquisition allows to add significant scale to our growing and profitable U.S. broadband business. It is a strong strategic fit for the company as it is complementary to ABB's existing footprint and capitalize on existing platforms. Under the guidance of Atlantic Broadband's experience management team, we are in a unique position to grow our customer base, revenues, and EBITDA to pursue our market expansion strategy. In Canada, this, the Canadian Radio, Television, and Telecommunications Commission, the CRTC, rendered two important decisions during the quarter. These decisions were balanced, demonstrating a regulatory approach that takes into account the importance of investment to the expansion of communication services and competition. They provide more certainty for both our wireline broadband network expansion investments and our plan to enter the wireless market in Canada under the right conditions. Regarding Wholesale rates for internet services. The CRTC's May decision to maintain the 2016 wholesale rates provides a more stable regulatory framework. This decision helps ensure continuity in our current and planned investment to increase access uh, to high-speed internet in underserved and unserved communities while we wait for the CRTC's decision following their review on the methodology to establish fair rates. Separately, Kojiko also welcomed 
the CRTC's decision on mobile wireless to allow regional players investing in telecommunication infrastructure and spectrum to access the wireless networks of Canada's dominant providers. This new regulatory framework is very similar to the one Kojiko advocated for years, where investments can be gradually deployed as a new entrant gain market share. Very shortly, a couple of key milestones will be reached as the incumbents file their wholesale terms and conditions and the results of the 3500 MHz spectrum auctions are known. Fiscal 2022 should be a landmark year with the integration of the recent OIO acquisition, the continued expansion of our network in Canada and in the United States, and a possible entry into the wireless business. In Canada, we have a rare opportunity to expand our network in underserved and unserved areas with the support of governments at various levels. The areas we are building could not be done economically on our own and will help close the digital divide. In the United States, there is an opportunity at the moment to accelerate network expansions in areas with good demographics and growth potential. The areas we plan to build in the U.S. can be done economically on our own and will also contribute to close the digital divide. Let's now look at Kojiko Connection. The integration of Deri Telecom acquired in December 2020 is progressing as planned. All employees have now been integrated into our Quebec operations and primary network interconnections have been completed. The overall EBITDA performance is slightly above our initial expectations, driven by favorable internet revenue, and the identified cost synergies are being gradually realized. Over the course of the third quarter, Kojiko Connection announced several network expansion projects. First, we announced on March 22nd that we will carry out 13 fiber to the home network expansion projects to connect more than 54,000 homes and businesses in Quebec. We also recently announced that we would connect 3,500 homes in Ontario, our expansion into rural areas with financial contribution from the federal and provincial governments represents a unique opportunity over the next few years to connect households in more rural and remote areas. So far, we have secured government funding for more than 80,000 homes pass, which we plan to build over the next three-year period. We expect to increase home pass by approximately 3% in fiscal 2022. And since we expect to be awarded government funding for further network expansion projects in Ontario over the next year, homes pass additions for fiscal 2023 could be as large as in 2022. Kojiko's deep roots in regions and rural communities should continue to, con to contribute to, it, to our success in securing grants to help close the gap in high-speed digital access. And true to our commitment to offer the best internet experience to our customers, Kojiko Connection has launched an enhanced Wi-Fi solution. This solution includes pods, which improve Wi-Fi propagation to further optimize the customer Wi-Fi experience inside homes and businesses. In the coming months, we will further enhance this Wi-Fi experience. Looking ahead, some of our key priorities at Kojiko Connection for fiscal 2022. We are committed to continue delivering the most reliable connection at all times. Committed to save our customers time by ensuring we answer their needs right from the start. 
to expand the distribution of Epico, our IPTV solution, to expand our network, bringing the internet to more unserved and underserved areas, and to increase our marketing efforts to become the number one brand choices. Now turning to Atlantic Broadband. We are also very pleased with the strong financial performance in the quarter, where EBITDA has grown by 8% in constant currency. If you exclude the non-recurring gain on disposal of assets disclosed last year. This strong performance was achieved despite a higher level of marketing and advertising investment, as these expense were deferred to the second half of fiscal 21 in the context of the pandemic. Similar to Kojiko Connection, ABB is also planning to be more active with network expansions. Some of those expansions will be network builds in underserved or unserved areas supported by government grants. However, we expect the bulk of expansions to be in the form of fiber to the home edge outs in adjacent cities with solid demographic and economic growth. As we have been successful with our network expansions in Florida for some time, we intend to replicate such a model in other states, which generally have less competition. We expect to increase home pass by close to 7% in fiscal 22, a pace which could be realistically pursued in fiscal 23 as well. We continue to be very pleased with the progress of our broadband first offer strategy, which has contributed to continued improvement in the gross margin. The speed mix we are selling with a high proportion of speeds of 400 megabit per second to one gig shows that today's customers see the value of high-speed internet. The modular design of our offer resonates with customers because of its transparency and flexibility so customer can select the product they prefer. Priorities for fiscal 2022 at Atlantic Broadband. We will focus on the integration of the OIO acquisition by welcoming our new colleagues into the ABB and Kojiko families, and by quickly integrating the integration of technical and operational systems. We will also be active in network edgeouts. We will continue to implement and refine our new broadband first offer strategy. And we will accomplish all this with, focus, uh, with our focus to remain on putting customer first with a highly engaged and committed workforce. As for Kojiko Media, we are optimistic about the radio outlook as the Quebec economy is recovering, and we see the continued commitment of our listeners as many of our stations were at the top of the spring numerous ranking. For our Montreal talk station 98.5, for example, it was ranked once again the most listened to radio station in the country. We were also pleased to welcome our new president of Kojiko Media, Caroline Paquet, who joined our team on July 5th. Caroline's successful track record has spanned over 25 years and has earned her a high degree of credibility in the fields of, of media and marketing. I will now turn to Patrice to present our financial results. Well, thank you, Philip. Uh, so revenue at Kojiko Communications is up 8.8% and EBITDA 5.8% in constant currency when we uh, compare to the same quarter last year. This was driven by EBITDA growth of 6.4% at Kojiko Connection and 5.9% at Atlantic Broadband. Free cash flow increased by 14% in constant currency. The increase is mainly due to higher EBITDA, the decrease in financial expense, and a one-time adjustment to the current income taxes in Quebec, which harmonized 
uh, with the federal legislation on accelerated tax depreciation. Capital intensity in the quarter was essentially stable at 20.3% when compared to last year. We are confirming our fiscal 2021 financial guidelines on a constant currency basis. We continue to expect mid to high single digit percentage growth in revenue and EBITDA and low double digit percentage growth in free cash flow. As mentioned, we purposely deferred some sales and marketing activities to the second half of the year as we gradually return to more normal operation and exit the pandemic. These expenses have impacted the EBITDA growth in the third quarter, and we will and will continue to impact uh, the fourth quarter as well. We expect low single-digit growth at Atlantic Broadband in the fourth quarter due to these additional expenses, and also last year's uh, political advertising, which was high uh, and uh, is not expected this year. At Cogical Connection, we expect the fourth quarter to have similar EBITDA as last year, which means that we expect a decline in EBITDA when excluding the Daily Telecom acquisition, as we recorded $4 million in last year, uh, last year um, which related to uh, some programming costs and also some uh, pandemic-related costs that we were uh, not incurring last year. In addition, we will be delaying some rate increases until the fall this year, so that will make a difference comparing the two quarters. We're maintaining our CapEx intensity guideline at 20% for the full year. And as for share buybacks, Cogical Communication purchased 414,000 shares in the quarter for $49 million. Now let's look at the individual components. So Cogical Connection's revenue increased by 10.2% in constant currency relative to the same quarter last year, while EBITDA increased by four, uh, 6.4%. Excluding the impact of Deri Telecom and also the impact of a $4.6 million retroactive charge related to the CRTC's decision on wholesale internet rates, revenue and constant currency would have grown by 3% and EBITDA by 1.6%. Organic revenue growth was attributable to the cumulative effect of the sustained demand for residential high-speed internet since the beginning of the pandemic, resulting in higher customer additions and customers' transition to higher value offerings, as well as rate increases implemented for certain services. The organic EBITDA growth was lower than last quarter, but was expected uh, due to the higher marketing and advertising expenses which I mentioned before. The broadband customer additions were modestly lower compared to last year, but ARPUs uh, were higher due to more sales of higher tiered products. The video product losses were lower than last year, partly due to our IPTV launch. And finally, the phone losses were in line with historical trends. Now turning to Atlantic broadband, revenue and constant currency increased by 7.2% in the third quarter compared to last year while EBITDA increased by 5.9%. Excluding the disclosed non-recurring gain uh, we had last year of $1.7 million, the EBITDA would have grown by 8% in this quarter if you exclude that gain. Organic revenue comes mainly from higher residential internet service customer additions, rate increases implemented for certain services, and also strong growth in our business sector. Similar to Cogical Connection, Atlantic Broadband incurred some higher marketing and advertising expenses in the quarter as these expenses were deferred to the second half of the year in the context of the pandemic. Broadband customer additions were higher than last year due to continued strong um, uh, demand for the product and the successful launch of our broadband first new offer strategy. The video customer decline is mainly related to the new approach, uh, the broadband first approach, and the fact that we don't offer video-only services anymore except for bulk units. And the phone product decline was relatively modest. Now let's take a look at Kojiko Inc. In the third quarter, consolidated revenue increased by 9.3% and EBITDA by 6.2% in constant currency. 
The broadband and media businesses both contributed to strong results. Even though the media business can continue to be impacted by the pandemic, we are noticing an encouraging recovery. Re revenue related to the radio operation increased by 23.6% in the third quarter <clears throat> compared to last year, which has been uh, significantly impacted last year by the pandemic. I will now discuss the uh, Kojiko Communications preliminary financial guidelines for the upcoming fiscal 2022 uh, fiscal year, which exclude the impact of the recently uh, announced acquisition of the Ohio cable systems from WOW, as the acquisition is expected to close only in the first quarter. We will be only in a position to update the guidelines for that acquisition once we know the closing date. On a constant currency and consolidated basis, Kojiko Communication expects to grow both revenue and EBITDA in the range of 3.5 to 4.5%. The Dairy Telecom acquisition, which was completed in December 2020, should contribute about 1% of this growth, as next year will include a full year of operation. At Kojiko Connection, we expect mid-single-digit uh, growth in revenue and EBITDA, resulting from low single-digit organic growth and the impact of the Dairy Telecom acquisition. The organic growth should stem primarily from strong demand for residential internet, and the upselling of customers to higher tiers, as well as the recent launch of the IPTV product. At Atlantic Broadband, we expect mid-single-digit organic growth stemming from expected continued demand for the residential and internet product, helped by our broadband-first strategy, and the post-pandemic business growth opportunities. We expect quarterly comparisons to be somewhat the inverse of this year, and we will be comparing a more normal year post-pandemic uh, with um, a year where we concentrated our sales and marketing expenses in the second half of the year. For that reason, next year, we expect the first half comparisons to be weaker than usual and the second half to be stronger. Organic revenue comparisons in the first quarter of fiscal 2022 are expected to be the lowest since Kojiko Connection is delaying some of its rate increases and Atlantic Broadband expects lower revenue from political advertising. And as I mentioned, we intend to invest more in normalized um, uh, sales and marketing expenses next year in both countries. And let's remember that the first two quarters of fiscal 2021 in both countries had exceptionally strong year-over-year -year growth. Now turning to capital expenditures, we are planning for capital expenditures in the 690 to 720 million dollar range, which includes 230 to 240 million dollars in network uh, projects. Um, and these numbers are net of government subsidies, uh, which are primarily related to the uh, expansions in Canada. This will result in a capital intensity of approximately 27%, and excluding these expansion projects, uh, it would be about 18%. The network expansions will result in higher uh, capital intensity in both countries, but are necessary to seize a unique window of growth opportunity. These expansions should add approximately 3% to our home staff in Canada and 7% in the U.S. during the year. Now, since these projects will take most of the, years, uh, the year to build, uh, both uh, business segments expect the growth in home staff to be towards the end of the year. Now, free cash flow on a constant currency basis should decrease between 30 and 35 percent, mainly due to the growth in um, network expansions next year. Excluding these expansion projects, the free cash flow on a constant currency basis would, in would increase uh, by about 13 to 14, uh, 18 percent. The recently announced Ohio acquisition will increase our estimated pro forma leverage uh, to 3.1 turns of EBITDA at closing, which is a level we're comfortable with and should allow us to pursue our dividend strategy as well as our share buyback program. Now at Kujiko Inc., we also expect 3.5 to 4.5 revenue and EBITDA growth next year and a decline of 30 to 35% in free cash flow. Excluding the network expansion projects, 
free cash flow on a constant currency basis would otherwise increase by 13 to 18%. I will let Philip provide his uh, concluding remarks. Thank you, Patrice. As you can see, fiscal 2022 looks very promising. Our businesses are on very solid footing. We are particularly excited by the network expansion opportunities, which should accelerate growth in fiscal 2023 when we are done with the first wave of construction at the end of fiscal 2022. Finally, I would like to give an update on Kojiko's commitment with regards to environmental, social, and corporate governance. We recently unveiled on our website and through social media our company's commitment on diversity and inclusion. While Kojiko's actions have long had social inclusion at their core, we are now making public our stance on the importance of diversity and inclusion and committing to continued actions on this front. In addition, we were honored to be recognized by Corporate Knights as one of Canada's top 50 corporate citizens for the fourth consecutive year with a new high, a 22nd ranking position. For a second year also, Kojiko received the Caring Company Certification from Imagine Canada, which recognizes outstanding leadership in community investment and social responsibility in Canada. We are proud of these recognitions and acknowledgements as we continue to strengthen and invest in our corporate social responsibility practices, ensuring the company operates responsibly and sustainably. Now we will be happy to answer your questions. If you'd like to ask a question at this time, please press the star, then the number one key on your touchtone telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Again, that is star, then one, if you'd like to ask a question at this time. Our first question comes from Aravinda Galapathige with Canaccord Genuity. Good morning. Thanks for taking uh, my questions. Um, I'll start with a couple of clarifications for for, for Patrice uh, on the uh, on the guidance. Uh, first of all, for 2022, uh, Patrice, can you just confirm that, given they're obviously fairly different exchange rates, uh, 134 for uh, 2021 and 127 for 2022, I just want to make sure that the three and a half to five and a half percent revenue growth you're projecting does not have any sort of uh, FX. Uh, component to it, given its sort of constant currency. And also, you mentioned Q4, low single-digit growth in ABB. I just wanted to make sure that's that's in Canadian dollars. Um, uh, that's not constant currency. Yes, uh, hi, Aravinda. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so the way uh, we have to look at FX, because uh, obviously it's uh, changed a lot since last year, uh, is you have to look at this year. Uh, we always provide guidance in constant currency. Uh, and, um, and then once, uh, obviously, we, uh, we will report the fourth quarter only next quarter, but you already have nine months in the year. Um, we expect the full year FX in 2021 to be about 127. Obviously, there's a, still a, a month and a half left. Uh, and uh, we are using the same rate to provide our guidance next year. So if the rate uh, stayed at 127, uh, then you would end up with the same numbers, basically. I don't know if that uh, answers your uh, your question. Yes, it does. It does. And, okay, and I, for, uh, yes. So uh, in terms of the Q4, my comment is actually in uh, constant currency for ABB. Uh, so it's a U.S. dollar uh, comments, and uh, again, primarily due to um, so due to the fact that we're going to uh, increase significantly the sales and marketing expenses in Q4 versus last year. And last year there was a, an election, uh, obviously during the quarter. Um, and when this happens in the U.S., we uh, we do end up with uh, special advertising during these this period, which will not happen this year, next year. Sorry. Thank you. 
that's, uh, that's perfect. And then uh, a bigger picture question. Um, you know, when I listen to the call and I just think of all the, the initiatives you have going, there's a lot of growth, uh, um, you know, uh, programs that's operating uh, in parallel. You've got the M&A in the U.S. and you've got the network address that uh, Philippe talked about. And I know that uh, Canadian Wireless is, is also uh, a prospect. So when, in that backdrop, uh, any comments around how we should think about sort of balance sheet management? Um, are there, how are you thinking about, are you open to other options? I mean, you have a structure on the ABB that includes the case. Um, I mean, clean equity, I don't know if that's something you consider. Can you just give us a sense of how you think of sort of managing uh, all these uh, initiatives? Yes. Um, so as we uh, disclosed when we announced the WOW transaction, uh, we announced that pro forma, the transaction, we would be at 3.1 terms of debt to EBITDA. Uh, our long-term target has always been three terms, so it's not too uh, far from that. Uh, and uh, before the WOW transaction uh, and what you're seeing in this, uh, these reported results were actually quite below our target. Uh, so we do feel actually that we're able to um, to fund uh, all these projects within our guidance. And as we make acquisitions, typically we're able to lever up higher than than what uh, our long-term target is. Uh, and we've done so in the past. We've levered up all the way to close to four times. Um, and um, our goal generally is to keep our ratings on the, on our uh, the ventures and. And as we stay within uh, within this band, uh, sub four times, uh, we are normally fine uh, managing it. So that's why we don't foresee a need um, at this time to uh, to make uh, something different in terms of uh, what you're referring to, uh, equity infusion. Thanks, Patrice. And a last question um, on the Canadian cable. Um, can you just give us a sense of, um, I know that the sector has been uh, enjoying a sort of an interact, internet uh, upgrade cycle because of the locked out uh, work from home conditions. You know, is that still spilling over? Are you still seeing that uh, cycle play out even as we sort of come out of these lockdowns? And uh, on the promotional side, at least Asavel and suggest that things are still quite, you know, not, you know, within a band, certainly not out of control uh, between Rogers and Bell as well. Is that sort of your observation as well? Thanks. Um, yeah, so obviously there was a period of time in the early part of the pandemic uh, where our, I would say, our additions to subscribers was higher uh, than usual. Uh, that had to do with some people connecting their house. Uh, some people did not have a connection in their house and some people moving from uh, slow DSL to our high-speed internet. Um, I would say, obviously, that we've been in this, uh, in this for a while now. Uh, so I would say we're more back to normal at this point, uh, but the business is uh, doing well. So it's, I wouldn't say there's a, there's a reduction uh, uh, foreseen, but uh, I would say we're more back to normal and more normal growth uh, from that standpoint. In terms of promotions, um, I would say it's always been a competitive uh, industry. I think your question was on Canada. Uh, it's always been a competitive industry. It's been throughout the pandemic as well. Um, that being said, because of the pandemic, uh, some of our sales channels, and it was true for other players as well, could not be used, uh, including door-to-door -door agents. Um, this is restarting now. Um, but I would say um, I would I would not say that there would be a much different pattern than what we've seen in the past few months. Thank you very much. I'll pop the line. Thank you. Our next question comes from Vince Valentini with TD Securities. Thanks very much. Uh, I want to try to clarify some of these edge out and rural expansion numbers because there was a lot of them. So. I think if, if I take a 3% increase in Canadian homes, that would be about 59,000, and a 7% increase in U.S. homes would be about 65,000. So can we add those two together, and it would be about 124,000 new homes passed by the end of fiscal 2022? Is that, is that correct? Yes, that's right. On a combined basis, that would be right. And the 80,000 figure then is basically just a, a different metric of, of how many homes in Canada 
have been won so far, but you won't build out those entire 80,000 by the end of fiscal 22. Is that correct, Patrice? That's also right. Uh, most, I would say a good portion of it will be done in 2022, uh, but some will spill over in the next year, in the following year. Okay. And then in terms of the CapEx, the 230 to 240 million, that is just your portion of the CapEx for those 124,000 homes. It doesn't include any of the, the government subsidy money. Is that correct? That's also correct. Uh, it's on a net basis, and that's how we're going to report it as well for accounting purposes. Uh, the subsidies uh, go against the CapEx, so it's always presented net, so that's why we showed it this way. So it, it seems a bit high compared to some of the other um, wins I've seen from other carriers. I mean, if you're spending eighteen to $1,900 per home passed, and then the government's kicking in a a big chunk on top of that. Some of the figures from other carriers seem to be more well below $1,000 per home is what they have to spend. So I just want to make sure it's, it's right. You're, you're spending 18 to 1900 per home pass to get these new homes? Yeah, so we uh, obviously every project is different. Uh, there's some in Canada, some in the U.S. as well. In the U.S., there's less uh, government subsidies. Um, whereas in Canada, most of them are with the government subsidies. We do include, though, uh, some additional costs. So there's some costs to connect houses from the street. Uh, we have some CPEs in there as well, because this is what we're planning to spend next year in these new areas. Um, so um, it's not always very comparable if, if, uh, if a, provi uh, a distributor will use only the uh, network costs without the connection and the success-based CapEx. So we did include some success-based CapEx. Uh, in these numbers, which explains the uh, part of the difference. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. And, and last one is, just to be clear, your your three and a half to five and a half percent revenue and EBITDA growth guidance. You're assuming zero contribution from these new homes, like none of them will be connected by you know May June of next year, so that you may get a a quarter of of the year with with some subscribers hooked up. You're assuming that's zero within the guidance. Yeah, that's right. It's, uh, it's, we've assumed zero uh, because most of it will come at the end of the year and then you, you need to start connecting people. Um, and when we look into the following year in F23, uh, then obviously we're going to start seeing some revenues. Because we have uh, plans to, it takes a couple of years to attain uh, your run rate. Uh, the first year, typically, you'll have some uh, ramp up during the year, obviously. And on the EBITDA front, you have some costs also. You do some marketing as well. So I would say the major impact of uh, these builds will be in F24, uh, but we'll see some of it in F23 uh, to a limited extent and uh, none in F22. Excellent. Thanks very much. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jeff Finn with Scotiabank. Thanks. Good morning. Um, maybe just to follow up on a couple of uh, Mrs. questions uh, on CapEx, um, is it fair to say that this capital increment here um, or any capital investment, does it include any wireless investment um, at this point for F22? Um, and then also regarding the, um, the subscriber take up and penetration, um, I mean, I, I think most of you understand that these areas that you're expanding into, both within the U.S. and Canada, are pretty underserved or unserved, and you're going in with fiber. So what should we assume for penetration going forward? I know it's going to take a year or two before you get to that full run rate, but, I mean, shouldn't we assume something very high, like well above 50% penetration once you're into these footprints? And then lastly, just from a pricing perspective, how do the rural broadband rates uh, compare to urban? You know, our understanding is rural tends to be a bit higher just because of the higher cost, but you've got some subsidies. So how does that all balance in terms of the rates at the, at the end? Thanks. Okay. Hi, Jeff. Uh, yeah, so on the... Uh uh, CapEx, it's, uh, no, it's, these are the expansion of wireline CapEx, so the 200 and 240 uh, million I referred to. So it's more traditional uh, expansion with fiber to the home, as you pointed out. Um, in terms of take rates, uh, we are planning and we've added a, 
some information in the IR presentation to that effect as well. So we're planning uh, in Canada to get to a 50% penetration rate. Uh, our target is three years uh, to get there. Hopefully we can do better than this, but that's, uh, that's what we assume uh, for now. Uh, with uh, unlevered returns in the mid-teens. So it's, uh, again, unlevered is, is an, an important word here, so mid-teens. Um, in uh, the U.S., uh, there will be a mix of uh, projects. Some are in areas that have uh, very little uh, competition, so underserved, and some come with government subsidies. But I would say the majority is not that case, where it will be more competitive areas, like we're doing in Florida and we've been doing for many years as well. Uh, so for that reason, the target in the U.S. is 36% over three years as opposed to 50%. Um, in terms of the, and it would be a similar return as well. In terms of uh, pricing, um, I would say we don't have a major differences in pricing uh, in Canada. In the U.S., it would be true as well, except in Florida, when we get into bulk units, then usually there's more discounts because you're it's a quite different market and, and a lot of efficiencies in, on the capital front. Uh, but otherwise, I would say it's, uh, you should not assume a major change in our uh, our crews. Okay, thank you. Um, and then just finally on capital allocation, um, you know, we've, you're now committed to um, the expansion in the U.S. with wow our assets. Um, you're committing to network footprint expansion both in Canada and the U.S., so that, that's a lot of capital uh, to be deployed. In terms of the, what's next on opportunity, can you talk about the next set of priorities regarding capital allocation? Yeah, I would say capital allocation is uh, similar to, uh, to usual. Um, and it's basically to invest in our business. So uh, grow, grow our business, introduce new products, uh, add capacity as well so we can sell higher tiers of services, and there's the IPTV product, so that's one area. Uh, acquisitions uh, has always been the case. I would say, obviously, with the Ohio uh, acquisition, uh, we should expect uh, smaller transactions if they present themselves uh, in the uh, short term, uh, because this one is obviously a, a larger one. Uh, the network expansions is something we find is uh, unique right now uh, as these government subsidies are available to grow in areas where we could not economically do it in Canada before. Uh, we have to seize that opportunity. So that will probably last. It will last more than one year. We think F22 will be uh, uh, probably the larger amount and then declining a little bit in terms of investments afterwards. But it depends on how many additional homes pass we win uh, in the next few quarters as we're applying to a number of these uh, additional projects. Um, and in the, in the, in the U.S., we'll, we'll, we'll see, but we see a, an opportunity right now to go in areas where uh, we are confident we can get good share and good returns. Uh, as for other, uh, other projects, we'll have to see how, how they, uh, how they uh, what, what comes, and, uh, but I would say that's what we're focused on uh, right now. Um, and maybe just to clarify, are, are you not mentioning wireless because it's pretty low in terms of priority, because it's pretty low in terms of return? Um, is there a reason why wireless is not mentioned? Yeah, for, for wireless, uh, actually, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention it. It's one of our capital allocation priorities if we decide to get into it. Uh, I will not comment on spectrum auctions. As you know, I can't comment on this. Uh, but in terms of... Uh, uh, capital and fixed asset uh, capital deployment if we do get into it. Uh, we've always said, and it's still true today, that uh, we would uh, like to invest as we grow and benefit initially from the MVNO regime and then uh, invest in uh, networks as we grow as opposed to day one for our fixed assets. Great. Thanks, Patrice. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question at this time, please press the star, then the number one key on your touchtone telephone. Our next question comes from the line of Jerome Dubray with Desjardins. Thank you. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, first question on, on your guidance. Uh, again, uh, the MDNA says that you expect benefits from uh, work from home will continue after the pandemic. 
uh, does that mean you expect customers will, will stay on the plans they chose or, or do you rather mean that the pace of increased adoption and ARPU growth could be higher for longer? Yeah, so, uh, well, it's difficult to tell. We don't expect uh, major changes. I, I think the, ma the, the bigger change will be that we initially were able to add more subscribers than, uh, than normal for the reasons I explained the uh, uh, earlier to another question, uh, but uh, in terms of uh, tiering and ARPUs, uh, we do expect that people who have upgraded their speeds uh, for doing video calls or whatever it is, we don't necessarily see a scale back afterwards. Uh, and um, it will probably be more of the, I was say, back to, uh, to normal pre-pandemic in terms of future growth. Okay, thank you. And then uh, on the Biden executive order uh, from, from last week regarding uh, potential restrictions to, uh, to maybe bulk units uh, and contracts with landlords, what percentage of your U.S. business is based on that type of contract, and, and how do you anticipate this uh, decision could impact the business? Yes, Jerome, it's uh, Philippe. Uh, well, uh, we, we do not anticipate material impact from um, – from the direction the Biden administration is um, is actually guiding the FCC and and, and other uh, regulatory and policy uh, bodies, we, we we on the Canadian side we've experienced many of these in the past. It's highly uh, competitive, and the regulatory structure in Canada is is already more complex. So we're used to operate under these conditions. Shall they come? But from what we have uh, seen so far, we do not expect material impact. Great. Yes, Monsieur. Thank you. Again, if you'd like to ask a question, that is star, then one. Our next question from the line of Matthew Griffiths with Bank of America. Hi. Thanks for taking the question. Um, and sorry to stick on CapEx, but I wanted to ask if you could um, give us some indication about the split between uh, the expansion CapEx between the two countries. Uh, and particularly, um, you mentioned that the 7% homes pass growth in the U.S. may continue the following year into 2023. Um, so, you know, just curious if the level of, you know, elevated CapEx on the investment would continue at the same rate in that following year um, and what that level could be. Yes, so the, the split for fiscal 22 uh, is close to half and half. It's a little more in Canada, a little less in the U.S., but close to half and half. Um, and that's why you're seeing, uh, obviously, we have a smaller base of homes fast in the U.S., so that's why you're seeing a bigger increase. As to uh, future years, we'll have to see. It will depend on uh, how the year goes and what we want to do. So we'll have to have that discussion a bit later on. Uh, as we see success in uh, building and attracting customers, uh, we'll, uh, we'll adjust our uh, level and interest in adding capital to it. But we do, expand, we do expect to invest uh, some capital in F23 as well. Is it going to be at the same level uh, is still a question mark. Okay. Yes, Ma Matthew, uh, maybe uh, just to add a little bit to, to this, um, when we look at the demographic and some high growth potential areas that uh, are not very far from our existing footprint, uh, we see a lot of options. But as Patrice just mentioned, we will go on a success base. Uh, we will certainly leverage a lot our financial discipline, but our very strong field operations. Uh, we, we, uh, we, we are uh, very optimist in our ability to, uh, to operate at the field level and actually win market share and then go from there. Okay, good, thanks. And uh, maybe just one more. Um, the U.S. seems to be, you know, ahead of Canada on the progress of reopening the economy. Um, I think, you know, you alluded to uh, in both markets, you know, the sales and marketing expense picking up as you progress into the year and into the beginning of next. And should we see what's reported 
um, your EBITDA margins for the U.S. as indicative of, you know, how the reopening additional costs from sales and marketing will impact Canada as well? Or is it, uh, can you, is there other distinctions that you'd like to draw? Well, there's not a major customer behavior between the, the two countries. It's more in relation to the market demographic and the competition level uh, uh, at the market level. So um, we, we have excellent products, really good customer service, and this is what really is making a difference uh, this customer during the pandemic has adopted higher speed in, in, in our services. Uh, we're expecting that first they will retain high speed access and second, uh, the application space continue to deliver more and more um, application hungry uh, and, and the, the sweet spot now of, uh, of speed uh, for in terms of uh, tiering is between 100 and, and 500 megabits. So we can continue to support the high demand uh, and keep people connected. Okay. Yeah, and and um, Matt, if I, if I can add also on the, uh, yeah. on the margins, if I got your question correctly as well. Uh, in terms of margins in Canada, we are seeing uh, next year to be in a similar place as this year. Uh, that's EBITDA margins. And in the U.S., we'll probably see an increase as we uh, have introduced broadband first, and it emphasizes internet, a bit less video. Um, although we're gonna introduce an IPTV product, so we're still believing in the video product, but still we do expect uh, more skewing towards internet. Uh, that should benefit the, the margins. And they, when you compare the two countries, uh, then it's a little different because the consumption of video is different in the US versus Canada, uh, and the packages are typically bigger, more expensive. And that's why the uh, EBITDA margins uh, naturally are lower in the U.S. Doesn't it, it, the dollars can be there, but the percentage is naturally lower in the U.S. than in Canada. All right, good to know. Okay, thank you so much. We have a question from the line of Drew McReynolds with RBC. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, and thanks for all the, the detail, uh, really, and Patrice. Uh, very, very helpful. Um, just one real quick one for me, just uh, on the margin question. I know you related to some higher programming costs in the U.S. that cycled in this quarter. Um, you know, we, we don't talk about programming costs too often up here in Canada, but uh, what, can you just update us on the dynamic of those costs and obviously your ability to, to, to absorb any, any inflation there? Yeah, I, I would, uh, just to be clear, my comment was more um, year over year or, or country to country, but um, the, this quarter did not have anything special in terms of programming. That being said, the programming costs uh, are usually increasing every year. Obviously, uh, we sign multi-year deals, so some years can, be, can have more renewals than others. Um, we've seen years um, in the past where the cost on a subscriber basis was uh, double digit, but I would say single digit now. So that's something we can manage. Uh, we do pass through uh, those cost increases to customers as well. But at the same time, we try to offer flexibility to customers. Uh, and again, through our broadband first approach and IPTV product, if uh, customers want to allocate dollars uh, to, between video and internet, the, uh, the idea is to provide that uh, capacity to the extent we can control it uh, within the guidelines of the uh, uh, content contracts we have. Super. Thanks, Patrice. I'm not showing any further questions at this time. Okay, great. Well, thanks everyone for being in today's call. So we look forward to disclosing our fourth quarter results in November. And feel free to call us if you have any questions. In the meantime, thank you. Bye now. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.